nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Mrs. Mayor, if you do the roll call, please. Absolutely. Tim Manniger. Here. Lisa Collins. Here. Gary Dunlap. Here. Tom Cruise. Here. Cheryl Hancock. Here. Anita Jagosinski. Here. Kate Mayer, I'm here. And Alex Aker. Here. Okay, great. With seven of the seven school board members present, I would declare a quorum. Uh, board norms and reflection. Again, um, the board norms are in our blue folder if you want to take a look at them and reflect on them as we proceed for the rest of the evening. Approval of the agenda. I would note that the agenda has been posted, distributed, and sent to the local media with this in mind. Are there any changes? Seeing none, I would entertain a motion to approve the agenda as published. So moved. Is there a second? Second. Discussion? All those in favor of approving the agenda as published, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Motion carries. <coughs> Public participation. Is there anyone who wishes to address the board relative to any item at this time? We ask that a five minute time limit per person be followed. Please come forward, state your name, address, and topic to be addressed. And we would ask that you come to the table to my right and have a seat. So far. Hi, I am Penny Schaefer. I'm a second grade teacher at Evergreen Elementary. Um, and I am here on behalf of, I would say, the students of Evergreen, the second grade students in particular. I want to address the, um, the number of students that are going to be in a classroom next year going down to two sections, which I think has been discussed before. Um, the background I want to give you um, is I am currently a second grade teacher, but I used to be the behavioral at risk teacher at Evergreen when this um, class was in kindergarten. And I worked um, extensively with this class. In three hours a day, I would spend in kindergarten, which has never happened before, due to the kids' social, emotional, and behavioral needs. Um, and yes, kids have matured, and they do not need that intensive um, intervention anymore, but there still are needs there. And um, only one of those students that I worked with a lot um, has left the district, and there have been a couple that have actually moved in that um, I definitely would have worked with at that age. So I want you to have the understanding of why we are so concerned. It's not just the numbers, because I know there are district guidelines and criteria that you have to look at, and I know probably the board is mostly concerned about if we make an exception for here, you're going to have to make exceptions down the road, and it will just open up this whole big can of worms. However, I would say as a teacher, um, and I know as a parent, um, if this was my child's class and as a teacher looking at them for next year, not only to just look at numbers, but you have to look at the dynamics of who those kids are, about what their, what their needs are academically, emotionally, behaviorally, um, physically, and the needs of the teachers too, but mainly the, the students, because this is going to be their class up through elementary school. And um, we as second grade teachers, sat down and um, looked at all of the students needs the title services so extra help in reading and or math esl english second language how many of the students are supported by that how many students have ieps because of varying needs um, and kids that have worked with the teachers that are at risk for behavior um, and we also did add in students that have attention issues um, whether they be on medication or not because that is a factor in classrooms kids that need that extra focus and need that extra attention because kids that especially that have focus needs you have to study say where kids should be placed in a room and when you have that many children there's no way that we can physically put them where it is best for them um, and when we looked at those numbers, there were only 40% um, of kids that did not receive or have needs. So that 60% of that class that have received support of some sort or have needs beyond a typical developing um, needs. And I think that's pretty alarming. And I think the, the school board needs to really understand that it's not just a number. If you take that and translate it into our own families, I have children. I have family members who have special needs and are in their, in their families. Um, 
that it changes the dynamics. It's not just, oh, I have four kids or six kids. It's I have six kids, but three of them need X, Y, and Z. And if you had 60% of your family who had additional needs that most people don't have to deal with, it changes the dynamic, not only for that, those kids who have those extra needs because they need that much more support, but it also changes the needs for the kids who don't have those needs. The kids that get overlooked because they do what they need to be doing and would normally get a little more attention, but they can't because the teacher is too busy with all those other needs that have to be addressed and not at anyone's fault, but it just happens. And that, is, that puts a strain on a family and our classrooms are our family. We spend more time with them than we do our own families the majority of the time. So I just really want you to not only look at the number, but I feel like you, you have to understand the dynamics of them. And I feel it's my job as an educator to, to advocate for those, those children. And for you to maybe, if there is a way to change policy and say, it is a number, however, we can make an exception if these things are needed. And if there are enough special and extenuating circumstances for this particular class because then it's a whole different can of worms that you're opening up and it's not just a hodgepodge of well yes we'll do it here and no we won't do it there but I think that is a dynamic that really definitely needs to be looked at there are um, physical needs that I worry about in um, putting two these classes in two rooms we have three students who use wheelchairs and one of them requires a stander, which is a very large apparatus and takes up more room than that TV area. And he additionally has a desk. That needs to, that's part of what he needs. And physically, if you have him in a room, then you'll have by himself, then the other room would have two students who use wheelchairs as well. And one of those students is really working on becoming independent. And there is no way with that many desks in the rooms upstairs, it is going to be very difficult for him to maneuver independently. And it will hinder his ability to be able to go up to the front of the room and sit in a circle, to hinder his, his ability to go up to the teacher's desk and ask a question independently. And that is really our goal, is to develop independent children. And a physicality space and the number of kids, because it's fiscally easier, better, or our, our policy, it, it should not hinder somebody else's development. And I think those things are huge factors that I just want to put a face to and say, you need to be aware that it's not just 30 kids in a room or 29.6 kids in a room or whatever the number would be. There are extenuating circumstances, as every family has, classrooms have too. And, and I want you to just be aware of that. Um, third grade also, just for people who don't teach elementary school, from second to third grade is a huge jump academically. The rigor of it, how much they expect them to produce, and the teachers expect a lot more, which needs a teacher's attention. And if they are dealing with managing behaviors and physically helping children maneuver within that room, academics are going to suffer. And I know that's what we all are here for, let alone the emotional, social, and the dynamics, if you have, let's say you had 30 children in your, in your family. There are certain children that should not sit by each other or don't get along with each other. There are a lot of dynamics that it makes it so much harder when you put that many personalities in a room, it changes things. Honey, if you could wrap it up. Oh, I'm please. sorry, yes, I'm good, I'm talking. So thank you for your time and I appreciate everything that you guys do too. Thank you very much. Is there anyone else who would like to address the board at this time? And just a reminder for folks, um, we usually do not respond or during the uh, public participation time because oftentimes it may be an issue that's not on our agenda or that we are not um, prepared to address or answer questions that sometimes rise during that time. I would note that under consent items, we do have a staffing um, item, so there may be some discussion there. So, thank you. I, do you want my name? Address? Yes, name and address, please, for the record. Christy Schrader, 311 Mallard Drive. This is my third <coughs> hopefully final nervous time of addressing you. <laughs> I've come up here before full of uh, emotion for my kid, but now, um, Along with that, I just want to point out a few other things. I researched 
online and looked and looked and looked, I couldn't find anything positive with going to a larger classroom. Um, early education is a time for the kids to learn coping skills, coping with different personalities in the room, coping with social dynamics combined with learning their education dynamics, um, coping skills all together. If you raise that classroom to a larger size, they're not going to get the best coping skills to deal with that. I think that takes away from something that they're really in need of. Um, I think another thing is the attention span of 30 kids in a classroom. Somebody else pointed out there's a lot of different personalities. That means three times the distractions from a student who's trying to learn from the teacher. I think if you add 10 more kids to that classroom, you're going to be looking at more distractions, not only from a teacher, but also from the student's standpoint. Again, you have to look at the physical space of the classroom. Um, let's take a fire drill. Are you going to have an aid per wheelchair in the classroom to make sure 30 students get out of the classroom and the building safely? That is another concern. My other concern is everything you read proves that smaller classrooms are the key to success in education, not only now, but later in middle school and in high school. This current class, if it stays at this number, and I know you shouldn't run on ifs, but they will have 29 and 30 kids in third grade, in fourth grade, and fifth grade, because we will never have enough kids to use in this formula. So now you've taken away all of their early years to learn how to cope with life and education combined. If they didn't learn it by second grade, they're not going to get it. That's another concern of my, sorry. Um, I, I guess I do have one question. I know you can't answer it, but we've heard a lot about this formula. And I guess there's a difference between guideline and policy. If this is a policy, is there a way we can look at changing? And if it's a guideline, if you do raise that number to 30 kids in a classroom, can you honestly say it's in the best interest of our kids? A guideline is just that, it's a guideline. You can look at all different aspects on how you can choose that number. Um, I guess if it comes down to looking at it from a dollar sign perspective because of budgets or anything like that, I would ask you to look in the benefit of the children instead of the financials. Um, sorry. <laughs> um, I think a better education now means better test scores, better kids, and a higher number of students who will score better in entry, college entry testing. You will see more kids wanting to go to college. You will see more kids graduating from college. I think if we look at the best interest of our kids, now we're going to see a greater return later in life from these kids. I really think you have to give them the best chance possible. Going to 30 kids in the classroom is not the answer. Thank you. Thank you. For the third and nervous time, for your time. <laughs> Thank you for coming. We do appreciate your input. Is there anyone else who would like to address the board at this time? Okay, then we will move on to um, recognition and thank you. Dr. Carlson, donations. Yeah, I'm just going to mention our thanks to the Kokarni family for recently donating to Sand Lake Elementary a weighted blanket, weighted vest, and a bicycle to be used uh, in their um, <coughs> special needs area. And so again, thank you to the Kokarni family. And at this time, I would invite uh, high school principal, Mr. Bob Bear, forward as we recognize our foreign 
exchange students who have been with us this year and as the year winds down we always look forward to this opportunity to introduce them good evening this on. <clears throat> at this point in time I'd like Miss Nicole Crosby to come up she was one of our guidance counselors at the high school and she does a wonderful job of working with our foreign exchange students and this year we have three of them that are here and the three up here as Miss Crosby says a couple things. Thanks. <laughs> I know they're not nervous because they just got done presenting on Friday to at least 150 people at the at the high school level and then they also did some really wonderful work earlier in the school year um, at both Viking Elementary and um, Prairie View I believe those are the two that we went to. Um, and they got to present to all age levels, so little kids, and then we had the big kids this last Friday. And so it was, um, it was a, a hoot, I guess you could say. I don't know if any of you high school students were there, but definitely um, they had them laughing. Um, and so it was, it was definitely a fun time. Um, these, these guys have been a really wonderful group this year. Two of them have been um, in a part of <coughs> our seeds group at the high school. And then I know Yost does a lot of things with uh, the music department at the high school as well so um, we've just really enjoyed having them but I'm going to let them say a few words about themselves. Okay so my name is Teresa Truncatova. I'm from the Czech Republic and I've been involved in tennis, basketball, soccer, art club. Yeah and that's it probably. I was in seats. It was my favorite subject at all. Yeah. yeah, I like choir and ceramics a lot, and another class that I like is language. Oh, my host family uh, is Mel and Bar Ozebrooks. They have Desha, she's a senior in high school. Hi, uh, my name is Minka van der Meulen, and I'm from the Netherlands, and I'm living with Karen Coleman. Um, she's the gymnastics coach and health teacher, and she's awesome to live with, so I really enjoy that. Um, in the fall, I was involved with dance team, and in winter also. And for winter, I was, um, no, not for winter. For now, I'm in soccer. And I was in seats, too, and I really love the classes at home and at all the people, so. Yeah. Hello, I'm Jos Haber from Germany. Um, I live with the rice in the family. And I've been involved <coughs> in several bands, I can't even list them, in football and track and field, and in physics, which is really enjoyable for me. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, and I just have a small token of appreciation. I hope I'm getting this to the right people. Oh. Okay, sure. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, and we really enjoy having you come. I don't know if any of the board members have any questions for you. I know I always like to hear what surprised you the most about your experience here. Yeah, yeah it's so many things. <coughs> yeah, it's like you can't really explain because it's two different worlds, so for us it's like not like really one thing because it's just totally different. But for me, I think it was more like the school. Um, we go work to school just. We have the certain subjects we have to, and every year we have to more intense things, like fun stuff, like choir, those is like in band, and also like the sports after school, like um, we're like really involved with the same people, so. Anybody else? Yeah, um, it was the same for me, like with the sport, it was something really different, and something I was really looking forward to do. And um, what else was really different was, um, I felt like the school could supply or physics, we have more abilities to work in the lab. And, um, I would say the classroom was in general nicer, more open and like. Yeah, I hear the same. I was in class after school, and then I was like teachers because they are actually caring about you. I know that teachers usually don't care about you, but like they're just like, okay, you're doing great. Over here, and it's like in Europe, it's more of a professional. Level, I guess, and up there, it's more like if in the Netherlands, if I would see a teacher in the store or something, I would never say hi. And here, he's just talking. Yeah. Well, we hope.
hope you know that you have enriched the lives of our students and our school family, and so thank you very much. We will see you on the stage at graduation. I hope you are all, all are going to participate. So thank you so very much. We're going to, we're going to get a picture. Ms. Crosby, Mr. Bear, why don't you join the picture? Thank you. Then we will move on to reports and discussion. Student Council reports, the middle school. We'll invite our crew up from the middle school, our student council representatives. Thank you so much for being here tonight. This microphone or this? Go ahead, use that, and then they can also sit at the table to present, to use those microphones as well. Absolutely. <laughs> I'm a sixth grade teacher at the middle school and the student council advisor, along with Carrie Holter, who's my co-advisor. Oh, not Holter, sorry, <laughs> Carrie Belong, wrong Carrie. Um, and we have three of our officers with us today. Kenna Pedretti is our president. Um, Olivia Torres is our vice president, and Gavin Friesen is our treasurer. Um, and they are going to tell you what we've done at the middle school with student council throughout our year this year. You can have a seat. And we just ask that you speak into the microphone because it has to pick up. We had a leadership building activity day at the beginning of the year for student council members. At that, we organized community groups, planned community service groups, and set goals for the year. Each of us officers led a pro community service project with a group of other people in student council. My group, we did a stuffed animal drive and we collected gently used stuffed animals to donate to the Home and Fire Department, which they give out to children when they have to come to their houses so they can have something to hold on to and for more comfort. Um, one of our other officers, Paige, played game is going to play games with residents of the Prairie Home Assisted Living Center in Holman and yeah, just have some fun time with them and just give them attention, yeah. Another one of our officers, Devin, she is volunteering at a local daycare this week. <coughs> and then for my community service project, we went to Evergreen Elementary and read with third grade students. For my group, we are making homemade treats for the Cooley Region Humane Society. And HMS Student Council sponsored two dress up weeks to show our school spirit for homecoming and to beat the winter blahs in February. And some of our things we did, we did twin day and then we just did school spirit day for homecoming. We ran school improvement groups to help staff accomplish tasks. Students designed and created multiple bulletin boards to celebrate student successes. Student of the month, student work displays, etc. We also helped teachers with tasks like cutting and laminating, and we wrote articles for the school newsletter <coughs> and more. 
We worked with HMS EF to hold an all-student fundraiser, and our principals decided if we raised a certain amount of money for our school, we could duct tape them to the walls, and oh our gosh. school raised enough money, and those are just the winning advisories who collected the most money who got to duct tape them. And do you remember how much you raised? Because I know you guys are always very good at raising a lot of money. I believe we raised 18 Oh my God. $18,000. Wow. That's terrific. With this money, we were, we were able to help provide sixth grade literature novels for the classroom and also help pay for seven re free reduced students to, a, to attend a field trip at Viterbo. Okay. Books and resources for pullout, tutoring, and regular classes, and new PE pants. There are 30 pairs for students to borrow. We also gave out prizes for the Jamming Minute, which is a classroom fitness breaks contest in the middle school. We set up new MyPlate resources for health class, as well as supply HMS Reads Marathon Movie Night. We offset the cost for the 8th grade immigration field trip, also offset the cost for the 7th grade high rollers field trip, and we did brain work games for lunch programs with the TAG students, and we donated money to support staff medical needs at our school. We baked and donated 40 pies to the La Crosse Community Thanksgiving dinner. And we also held three school dances. These are pictures from our Halloween Academy dance party. We also helped lead parents to classrooms during parent and teacher conferences. If they had any questions or were lost, we helped them find their way. And student council also brought snacks for the staff. <coughs> Members of our student council spoke at the Veterans Day Assembly with our guest speaker, that was Brian Rietzel. We also held a tailgating themed staff luncheon for the middle school staff to thank them for what they do for us, and we had some fun times. So. <laughs> we also gave tours to the fifth graders who will be joining our school next year. We will end the year with a field trip to celebrate all of our successes and work on some leadership skills and start planning for next year. Thank you. Holy God. Before you go to, I don't know if any of the board members have questions. Um, I have a question. A comment, first of all, you're obviously future leaders and you've put a lot of thought into what you do and um, I'm guessing that's a lot of hours beyond your homework time and activities that you're in. So I thank you for that. But I always like to ask um, young people that are on um, a committee or a managing board, what would you like to see happen in the future that you didn't have time to do this year? Maybe I'm putting you on the spot. <laughs> I'd like to help increase our school's atmosphere, just make it feel safe to everybody and more open to all people. I think it would be kind of cool to do more with the community, like we already have done a lot with the community, but if we could do even more, that would be really nice. So. I agree with Olivia, um, student council, we love to help people and helping our community is one of my favorite things to do. So I believe that um, helping our community even more would increase our level of success. Of success. <laughs> <laughs> well, I thank you. I thank you for your ideas. Keep them coming. Um, always know what you want to do that you haven't been able to do, and you will succeed. And all the hours that you put in, and your advisors as well, very grateful. Very grateful. Yes, thank you. We always enjoy having student council come forward so that we can hear all of the good things that you did. And as I mentioned, fundraising, the middle school group has always been traditionally a high fundraising group. So congratulations on your continued success. So thank you very much for coming tonight. And then we will have a report from the FCCLA.
Good evening. I'm Mrs. Sarah Halverson, and I am the FCCLA advisor at the high school. Um, and I have two of our officers here this evening with us. Ms. Brenna Davis is the FCCLA high school president this year, and Ashley Taylor, who is the vice president of community service. And they will be um, explaining our year in review with you guys. Okay, so our first slide is titled FCCLA, and what is it? FCCLA stands for Family, Career, and Community Leaders of America. Basically, it's a national student organization, and our first level of our high school chapter is just a general membership, and then students can decide if they want to compete with FC FCCLA, which we can talk about later. And basically, it's a club where students can find leadership opportunities and learn skills and mm -hmm. other leadership skills that they can use later in life and then we have our mission statement in the corner too our chapter currently consists of 38 members along with four chapter officers myself ashley taylor caitlin lubinsky and michaela wench and it is headed by our advisor miss sarah halverson so then for the competition side of our chapter, we start off with our regional competition February 14th of this year. We competed at Western Technical College of La Crosse and we had 19 competitors compete. And we had a really great year. All 19 competitors competed at the state competition, which was March 31st through April 2nd at the Wisconsin Dells. From there, we started to or we're going to compete at our national competition July 6th through 11th in San Antonio, Texas this year. We have nine national qualifiers. They are Brenna Davis, Caitlin Lubinsky, Ashlyn Fonstad, Lydia Shriver, Michaela Wench, Mackenzie Schmidt, Brooke Limberg, Emily Medema, and Nicole Tomter. Um, following is a list of all our national qualifiers and their projects. The first one is Emily Brooke and Nicole's project, and they competed in chapter showcase display, where they made a presentation to show the judges everything our chapter does, from community service involvement to fundraising, to our meetings and ceremonies, to our recruitment for members, to leadership, and then finally in our social gatherings. So then next we have Mackenzie Schmidt. Mackenzie's event was Chapter Service Project Display. Basically, she ran a le literacy project campaign and she went around to local businesses and asked them for donations for gifts and money for books, bags, and other supplies to promote childhood literacy. She organized a book drive at the school and she collected gently used children's books and she also wrote and received a $250 grant to help with her cause. And in the end, she donated 250 literacy bags to various local local organizations some of them included the lacrosse boys and girls club bolton refuge house and gunnerson lutheran michaela wench competed in fashion design where she made her own original dress she designed the whole entire dress and made it herself and for her presentation she made a, a portfolio display in the process of it and presented that at a competition so then we have Lydia Shriver and Ashlyn Fonstad, and they competed in entrepreneurship, which is where you write a plan for a business, and they decided to create a prom dress recycle boutique business that was targeted at high school students. And finally, we have myself and Caitlin Lubinsky, and we competed in Focus on Children. And for our project, we came up with a series of cooking classes for elementary school students, grades first through fifth grade. And in that class, we taught them basic kitchen <coughs> safety and sanitation. And we also worked with them on small fractions and the different ingredients. And we taught them fun and easy recipes that they could duplicate at home with their parents. So then for our last slide is basically an overview of all that we accomplished this year. It has everything on there from we made and donated 20 plus pillowcases, our pillowcase dresses to third world 
country girl so they could attend school. We planned a miracle minute for the Jenny Olson family and donated $520 to that cause. We have all of our competition on there and then we ended with our state competition which was really eventful and successful this year. We earned a 250 chapter foundation grant. We had our first state officer elected, Brenna Davis, which she'll talk about with you. And then we also had our nine qualifiers that we just shared our project, shared their projects with. The process for running for a state officer consisted of me taking a test, getting interviewed, and presenting a one-minute speech at the state conference. And I was elected as the first price, vice president of finance. And for that, um, myself and the uh, six other officers will be overseeing all the chapters in Wisconsin and doing chapter visits. And we also make executive decisions for all the chapters within Wisconsin. And we will be um, planning and running the state conference next year and attending a bunch of meetings this summer along with that. So thank you guys for your time. Thank you very much for coming. Are there any questions? Well, again, ladies, thank you very much for coming this evening and sharing a little bit about this. It's always great to see some of the successes of our student groups, and we do appreciate your taking the time to be here. So thank, thank you. you. Thank you. So next are our presentations on curriculum. Looks like world languages is up. Begin with world language. <coughs> All right. Um, I'm Carrie Burgum. I teach Spanish at the high school, and I'll be completing 29 years this Ooh, end of the school year. So I'm the old one, I guess. Um, I would like to welcome the new board members that I have not actually had the opportunity to speak in front of. So welcome, board. Um, it's great to always have new faces. We are here to provide um, just a, an overview of our curriculum for you. Um, what we've done is we um, put this together in Google Docs. It still isn't complete. There we go. I'm getting better at these technology things. All right, um, first of all, our um, cover page that's actually on our curriculum. Um, and then our membership or our department it consists of 612. Um, those are all the people there. We have five at the high school and two at the middle school. Uh, French and Spanish are the two languages that are covered. On our timeline, um, we started approximately three years ago in September um, de deciding what we were going to do with the new template um, that was presented to us by Wendy. Um, through October and December of 2011, um, we got together um, with former members of the department who were part of the department at that point and came up with methods for our self-study. In February, uh, we got staff, students, parents, administration um, together to do um, parent-teacher conference surveys. Uh, we did them through an email blast um, and also through Homeroom. And I can't say enough thanks to our LMC directors, Lisa Risch at the middle school, Aaron Foster, and also my colleagues in the World Language Department who gave up their free periods to make sure we could get that survey done with all of the people that were done uh, pulled through the random um, method. In March, we had an external evaluator visit. Um, Kathy Hawkins is a retired French teacher at the La Crosse School District. She met with parents, students, staff, and administrators, and she had a series of questions that she proposed, and we had added some that we thought were important, and she put her um, directive together, um, what she had witnessed, um, and found out the feedback from those various groups. It was an entertaining day and you gotta love kids when they're talking because they don't they don't mask anything. It was pretty awesome. Um, in October, um, members of our department uh, went on site visits to Stevens Point, Wisconsin Rapids, La Crosse Logan Middle School and Alaska Middle Schools to get ideas, see what worked for them, um, see how our program went up against those. In October, from October 2012 to April 2013, we analyzed and organized all that data into the self-study document. And we were here approximately a year ago um, where we presented to the Curriculum Council and to the school board. 
Um, actually, Wendy did. Um, and then from that point on till now, we've been working in PLCs after school and early releases, any chance we can get to put the document together. Um, and tonight is the culmination of presenting it to all of you. So. The next few slides basically give you the description from our um, curriculum course books at the high school and at the middle school. So they just list exactly what those, um, the, the class do and what they cover so that if you were a parent and helping your child make a decision that you could look and say oh this is what they're going to cover and how it continues to move forward with regard to going up the level um, all the way through the high school level our standards um, are we have what we call the five C's and these next two slides list all of those they break them down obviously the biggest one is communication um, within that one, we have interpersonal, interpretive, and pre presentational. It's important to remember those because that's exactly how we're guiding our assessments at this particular point. Um, it's what you will hear um, pushed in all of the levels of um, <coughs> anywhere language um, learning is, is existing. Um, the last two comparisons in communities. All of these categories have three or four levels rather, beginning, developing, transitioning, and refining. A K-16 program would give you all the way to the end of the refining. A 612 will give you to the end of a developing beginning of transitioning. Um, it is spiraling, so what you're taught the lower levels will continue to show its face over and over and over again, giving eventually um, the expertise in that particular area. Our national standards, which uh, you can see similar to um, the state standards based on those five C's, um, once again, um, they're a guide for us. We actually have a very personal connection. Um, Mr. Paul Sandrock is now serving on that, um, is employed by ACTFL, was the Wisconsin DPI for, um, foreign language, it was called at that point, um, spokesperson and has been a real asset for us. He still comes back to our Waffle conference in the fall in November, um, does quite a few things. We had a question earlier, put out an email, said, hey, Paul, we need help with this. Came back, he's, oh, this is great. I've got this idea and this idea. And so now once these things, this part of it is out of the way, we're going to explore some of the ideas that he sent to us. This, um, as we all know, the Common Core, um, we're not considered a core, and we were put in um, a technical group to start with. Um, that doesn't quite work. <laughs> so ACTFL, our national um, group, designed our common, our common Core to align with the English Language Core. And that makes sense, reading, writing, speaking, and listening, and language. And it seems to fit very nicely as we continue to do our modes of communication um, with the proficiency levels of language. These last couple slides, this is our goal as we look at all of the different units that we have, is to continue to make the modes of communication evident in our assessments at each unit. So we would have an interpretive assessment, a presentational assessment, an interpersonal assessment. This is a middle school Spanish one, the high school French, and the high school Spanish. And as you can see, interpretive is to understand what they've been presented or they're reading. Presentational is that polished one. You've practiced, you've made sure the words are spelled correctly, they're pronounced correctly, um, so on and so forth. And interpersonal is the one that, let's strike up that conversation. And that's our goal and that's what we will continue to do as we work on this curriculum to make sure that we have those assessments in each unit. So that is our presentation. Any questions? Yes, I have a question. Um, thank you, um, both of you, for what you do, first of all. Um, what are your hopes and dreams? I mean, what are you still wanting to accomplish? I know a year ago we talked about a, a few options and, and looked at them and approved what's happening now. Um, how are we with all of that? Are there things that... Yeah, that you're still wishing for or that you see other districts doing that you want to pursue and study? <laughs> we're, always, we're always continuing to work forward. Right now, we're very excited about this. 
this is something that you will see um, in any of our conventions, um, the push to get at these three modes of communication. Our main goal is our students, and I had said this at, our curric at the curriculum council meeting, um, we need to tap our graduates. We haven't quite figured out how to do that because they're the ones giving us the best feedback about what we could have done differently, what we should have been differently, um, what would have been more beneficial and more helpful. Um, one of the things that we have worked on and that um, came as a result of, I believe, Jen and um, Brian Wolpat was our, um, what do we call interpersonal communication grid um, rubric, whatever. We actually have students assess themselves as to how much they believe they've used the target language throughout the class. Um, I personally do two of them. Um, they do one, I do another. Um, each teacher may do it a little bit differently, but each student, everyone in the department does it. And so if I, the students that come from me go to, to Ms. Olivares um, or to Mr. Kruger, they're gonna see that same format so they know to expect it. Um, right now we have a young lady past graduate who is studying in Uruguay. She keeps sending back ideas saying, oh, we could use this, we could use that. Um, oh, <laughs> and she calls me Auntie Carrie, but um, Auntie Carrie, you could have done this, add this, oh, this is so cool, your kids will love this. Um, you guys did this really great. You know, so it's that kind of dialogue, open and honest. Um, as far as other school districts, um, we haven't since they were out to those. I don't know that we've necessarily been there. What I will say, is thank you to the board, thank you to Mr. Bear, um, to Ryan Vogler and all of those people that are supporting world language. Um, recently, Menasha um, voted via referendum to discontinue their K program. Um, and the woman who brought me in to serve on the board of Waffelt um, was the woman, one of the women who started that program and it's very defeating to her to see that whole thing. And they have a beautiful K-12 program, but they won't be doing it as successfully in the um, elementaries anymore. So even though, as you ask our dream, K-12, however, we're very grateful that you support and you keep looking and you keep asking us. And I know, Cheryl, you've said before that it's defeating to not be able to give us that. We understand that. Um, we would all like that, and I know that if you had this bucket of money that every single one of you would give every single one of us what we wanted. <coughs> but right now, we're gonna shoot for what we know we can accomplish, and we're gonna hope that somehow, you know, there's that money tree in Dr. Carlson's backyard, and so he's going to help <laughs> us all, right? So, um, uh, unless my colleagues have something to add to that list. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Thank you very much for presenting this evening. We love to hear about what's going on in the classroom. Thank you very so much. Thank you. And the art department, yeah. I think, is up next. <coughs> okay. No, I'll just wave. <laughs> if you want to, I mean. <coughs> I will. I will. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm Matt Langrick, and I'm a middle school art teacher along with Amanda Kerrigan. And um, this is our presentation of our curriculum. I know you received our curriculum last week, and I'm sure you read through every page. It was huge. Um, so we're just going to try to overview that for you so you understand kind of what we put together and how to look at it. Um, this is probably the most important page I'm going to show you is the people that wrote the curriculum. Um, they're all sitting over there. Um, they can wave their hand if they're here. Um, John why Bolin. All, why don't they stand? It's oh, good for, stand. We've got new board members. so John nice Bolin and Viking Elementary. Jen Grass, Evergreen. Amanda Kerrigan, Middle School. Then me. Christine Michaels, High School. Liz Shank, High School. Jenny Stage, Sand Lake Elementary. Marcy Tauser travels to all elementary schools, <laughs> and Amy Wink at Prairieville. Um, I'd like to thank these folks because, I mean, they put in a lot of hours, and as you can see, that's, it's a massive document, and I mean, I think it turned out 
we're very proud of it and you know it's that's due to all these folks um, the timeline last year 2012 2013 school year we completed our self-study again we were here last year and um, K through 12 school visits we all went and visited different um, various schools surveys with parents staff and students um, outside our ex expert review Marcy Tom, Tom, Marsha Thompson came in and um, creation of an action plan and then the 2013 2014 school year we wrote curriculum based on the results of our self-study so we stuck to that pretty close strategic objectives um, we really tried to stick to these four as we all looked at the curriculum we were writing this was all coming from our self-study um, student achievement and learning we wanted to make sure it was a consistent delivery of k-12 <coughs> excuse me our curriculum um, a, a scope and sequence and I think we achieved that um, we have um, we have through PLCs and all that we had tons of communication and we wanted to make sure it was student driven um, the entire document uh, our strategic strategic objective two was communication um, where we wanted communication with parents students staff community through newsletters and websites now the new newsletters I think we're doing well um, the website as probably you know was changed this year and it tweaked a different way so we're be kind we're catching up with that and that's we push that towards next year so now that the website's pretty settled we can all get going with that strategic objective three fiscal sustainability equal incre increased budget per student um, k-12 provided needed technology to all our students as we know our times are changing with technology we're trying to keep up with the times um, k-12 in the art department and of course you know as we understand too money is money and you got to put it where you need to put it um, feel free to push it towards us that'd be great we'd accept <laughs> it but um, we understand and we, we just keep pushing for our students and continue trying to you know get as much dollar as we can for our students and our final objective performance excellence um, we want to keep consistent with professional art association memberships again that's pretty pricey so that's something that we have to decide um, how we're gonna fund but that's you know those are what we tried to stick to now as you look through the document k-12 <coughs> we pretty much stuck to the same format um, learning targets this is an example of elementary I'm not gonna read it for you all the way through but just so you can understand um, unless you want me to um, no, no, no. I don't think so though. yeah I like the detail thanks uh, I'll let you read it later um, we basically um, came up with the desired results uh, wanted to tell what the students we wanted to know what they wanted to understand and then we came up with questions to get them to understand and to get the conversation going and then we decided what the students should know what the students should be able to do and then down below you can see our performance tasks we put <laughs> rubrics into the document um, formative assessments other evidence of assessment as you can see on the left side established goals those are the state standards and then the common core standards we include common core standards in our um, lesson plans and our unit plans and our, our goal was basically just to keep a consistent k-12 and we want if one of us happens to move on somewhere we wanted a new teacher to be able to come in see where we're going give the freedom to that new teacher flexibility yet everybody's still covering the same across elementary doesn't matter which elementary school you go to which our teacher you have in high school or middle school it's covered the same requirements and this is a uh, successful example of that 3d project that the elementary school did this is a middle school example of a 3d again you can see the formats about the same um, and we just wanted to keep it sequential this is a successful example of a three-dimensional mask at the middle school and then the high school you can see that the understanding and essential questions get bigger longer more detailed as the um, level of um, student as the age of student gets you know older and that's just you know typical you can discuss deeper discussion with an older kid than rather the elementary student so you can see the format that's a successful example um, where are we going here from here 
um, we wanted we wanted to make it a working document. So as we start the curriculum next year, um, we wanted it to be able to be revisited and um, improvements made, tweak it uh, where we need to. Um, we're going to be doing that through um, documentation, meetings, PLCs, observations, and then we're just going to be able to continue and improve this document as we go. Our next steps are implementing it next year and um, using the dollar allocation from Wendy, whatever that may be. We don't know what that is yet. And hopefully that will be able to um, spread throughout K-12 <coughs> and, you know, be used to benefit our students. And that's it, I guess. Are there any questions? Okay. Yeah, just a couple of comments. Because um, I think it needs to be said every year is that the arts shape every human. And as adults, we spend a great percentage of our time with the arts. And I thank all of my art teachers who do what they do with our children um, from saving lives for kids that haven't maybe found any venue except your classroom so I really appreciate that um, I really support also that um, you are all joining your professional organizations because that keeps our program sound and state-of-the-art so um, I just really like that so everything you do that helps create future citizens that help keep us all sane because of the art they produce um, I'm grateful I'm very grateful and I hope you feel our support in this district for the arts. I think everybody up on this panel um, appreciates what you do. Well, we appreciate what you do. Well, yes, I would also concur. Thank you so much. I only have one issue with art, and that's one of storage. <laughs> <laughs> I have a kindergartner in Evergreen, and she brings home this beautiful artwork. And what do you keep and what do you not keep? It's, yeah, going to be. We well, keep it all. I know, I know it, I know. <laughs> remember that when you're helping me move those boxes <laughs> I, have it all downstairs. I know it's just it's wonderful to watch her grow through her artwork and just looking at what the pictures that were on the wall when we went for a family picnic the other day that some of the artwork that was on the wall for kindergartners it's it's wonderful and so um, thank you for what you do in the classroom each and every day and I know that the curriculum a lot of work went goes into this not only the art curriculum but the world languages as well and it's outside of the classroom stuff so we do appreciate that what you put into it and I hope it will be a useful guide um, for you in the in the future so thank you for coming and I presenting. just have to make a comment too Kate you're so eloquent and you put it so beautifully I just have to say art is such a mystery to me because I have <laughs> Liz <coughs> Shank saw me at, at um, the Bulls Day at the high school. I have this much talent in art, and I'm, I am just blown away by anyone who has artistic talent. So you guys are, are my idols. It, I mean, I can get math, physics, science, anything, but art, I, I would flunk. I'm horrible <laughs> at it, so kudos to all of you. Oh, but we do. We really appreciate. I would <laughs> so echo, thank you. Yeah. I would echo Cheryl too. I have six grandkids, and I'm not sure I have a refrigerator. <laughs> 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 Just kind of all covered with. And I noticed your 3D and uh, elementary school. I have a couple of them on my desk at work too, and and uh, they seem like they really enjoy it, and they're really proud of their work when they come home. So appreciate the work you do. I saw, I think it was a YouTube video or a posting somewhere that said parents and what they do with children's art in September. And then they followed it through May. And in September, everything was up on the refrigerator and it was posted all around. And in May, it was in the garbage can. <laughs> so, but no, I know. Oh, is right. I agree with you. I had five daughters and we have portfolios for every single one of our daughters still. Um, keep it all. You're right. And you just mm -hmm. buy a bigger box. That's yep, right. There you go. <laughs> so thank had, you very much. I just had one thing oh, to say yeah. about my daughter is in kindergarten, Miss Wink's class, and we use a lot of her artwork for gifts to family members. So we've saved some money on Good gifting, idea. and family members seem to love those the best. The other thing that I noticed that art class has done, you know, for my daughter is this sense of being okay with something that she has created. And no matter what it is, because she's tried to teach me that too. She, I, we do a lot of arts and crafts at home and crazy projects. And she, when I'm trying to fix something, she'll say, 
mom, it doesn't have to be perfect. It's perfect <laughs> just the way it is. And so I, I really, I think that <coughs> message is one of the biggest pieces to arts is really loving yourself and what you create. So thanks for that. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you very much. And the next report is for the self-study for health. I just want to thank you guys for allowing us to share our self-study. Um, we we're really excited to work on it. It hasn't been updated since 2001, so it definitely needs to be done. Um, my name's Heather Foley. This is Carrie DeLong and Christy James, and we teach at the middle school. And then we also have our um, health and PE teachers from the high school and our elementary teachers at the elementary and K-12 um, guidance teachers with us.
While she's fixing this, I will start with our mission and vision. Um, the, Holman's, the School District of Holman's Health Education Program's mission is to empower students to become health literate individuals that make healthy decisions and informed decisions to make healthy lifestyles. Sorry. Our mission is to develop health literate individuals that learn concepts related to health promotion and disease prevention to enhance their health, to analyze the influences of their family, peers, our culture, media, and technology, to access valid information, to enhance interpersonal communi communication skills, excuse me, to avoid those health risks, to use decision-making and goal-setting skills, to practice health-enhancing behaviors, to avoid risks, and to advocate personal, family, and community health. Our current health curriculum delivery from the elementary schools taught by classroom teachers and school counselors. At the middle school level, we have a sixth grade requ required curriculum that is 45 days and an elective in seventh and eighth grades. Our high school curriculum consists of ninth grade required curriculum that is one term and elective advanced health one and two. To complete our self-study, um, we gather data using <coughs> analysis. We use the HECAT, which is the health education curriculum assessment tool put out by the Centers of Disease Control. We also review DPI requirements from Wisconsin state statutes. We completed, completed needs assessments. At the high school level, we used the Wisconsin Youth Risk Behavior Survey. 948 students participated in that. At the middle school, we used a risk behavior survey. And at the elementary level, at grades two and five, we completed risk behavior surveys as well. For parents, we had 624 families respond um, to a survey based on needs. Our key findings, strengths we found, our connection with the community, such as organizations like DARE and the Cooley Council on Addictions. Um, our middle school and high school curriculums are currently taught by licensed health teachers. At that middle school and high school grade levels, we have common assessments. We are currently meeting DP DPI requirements as far as having the sixth grade required health class by having the ninth grade re required health class. Also at the high school level, we are meeting statutes by offering CPR and AED instruction and also teaching um, suicide prevention. Through our parent survey, we found strengths that 90% of parents that surveyed agreed or strongly agreed that nutrition be taught K through 12, and we are currently doing that. 84% felt that tobacco, alcohol, and other drugs should be taught three through 12, and that's something that we're currently doing. And 85% thought that growth and development should be taught in grades three through five and nine through 12, um, and we are meeting it at those grade level, gro excuse me, those grade levels. Our opportunities for improvement. With our current written curriculum, the one that was improved back in 2001, um, it's not a standards-driven document. It's primarily content areas. Um, majority of the objectives are taught are knowledge-based or that standard one. Our HECAT indicates that the curriculum doesn't allow for students to master standard skills, so practicing those skills. There are not specific learning objectives in our current curriculum. We lack materials and resources to support it. Um, classroom, not all classroom teachers, particularly at the elementary level, do not have a copy of the current curriculum. And the current curriculum does not align with the Common Core State Standards. And development of a modified health curriculum for students with disabilities is not in existence at this time. Curriculum delivery opportunities for improvement. Currently there is inconsistencies of instructional time, contents, and assessments at the elementary level. Um, increased sustainable funding is an opportunity for improvement. Regular access to technology, especially since health items are changing so rapidly. Not all middle school students are receiving instruction on human growth and development at this time. Not all standards are covered due to time constraints of required classes. And currently, we're not meeting the board approved curriculum because of continued reduction in required health classes. As far as state statutes, opportunities for improvement um, are at our elementary level. Teachers are not under the direction of a licensed health teacher. Um, our curriculum does not reflect current health education state statutes in the areas such as human growth and development and suicide prevention. 
every few years new state statutes are coming out and as we said we haven't reviewed it since 2001 so there's opportunities for improvement at this time we do not have a human growth and development advisory committee and communication and distribu distribution of those changes because they are happening so often um, we need to develop a, a system to make sure those changes are updated and everyone's informed including all the stakeholders opportunities for improvement from parent and guardian feedback. Um, parent comments indicate the need for more family involvement and also communication to families in regards to the curriculum. Parent comments also indicate some concern about nutritional practices in the school setting and indicate that parents want um, health topics to be taught at developmentally appropriate levels. Student needs assessment show the need for continued and improved health education. Okay, looking at our um, strategic objectives. Um, the first one is on our student learning. We need to develop and scaffold a standards-based assessment. As Chrissy was talking about, everything is content-driven. Um, it has gone to a, a national and state standards of being able to do, develop those skills and not just know the content. Um, incorporate common core standards in those, align the curriculum. Um, create common assessments and then also developing um, curriculum for students with different disabilities. Um, also to update the elementary report card with the new standards and then to increase the middle school requirement um, beyond sixth grade. Um, for communication, we um, need a director of comprehensive school health program. Um, this person would help develop a system of communication when state statutes change, educate and inform families and then also create connections and communicate with outside agencies. Um, this person could also help form a human growth and development advisory committee. Um, that is a group of stakeholders that are not the just health teachers, but community members, school board members, um, other people to form what we are gonna teach, especially as state statute now allows for more, more flexibility on what school districts allow being taught. Um, fis fiscal sustainability, providing sustainable technology. We talked about things being changing, so for us to order textbooks wouldn't be fiscally responsible. Um, we need some type of technology so that students can use things that change um, in, you know, every year, every day, things are coming out that are new. Um, provide professional and staff development for health educators and especially elementary teachers who don't have as much of a background in the health area. And then also the updated resources. And finally, um, the capacity of performance excellence is we need um, to make sure we review recommended instructional minutes for, with the DPI, um, provide a licensed health teacher um, for elementary classroom teachers, and then have a director of comprehensive school health that will align our health education, physical education, nutrition service, you know, um, counseling, psychology, psychology services, and social services, as well as our wellness policies and community development. That's what we have in our many members. Any questions on the self-assessment? Yeah, I have a question. <clears throat> Just curious, what do um, parents think of this program? What's your kind of feedback from them? From what we hear is there's not enough communication um, on what is being taught and where the requirements are. Um, it's changed over the years, and sometimes parents don't realize that um, maybe it's not required in other grades in seventh and eighth grade, so they're just getting in sixth grade unless they decide to take it. Um, but we definitely had a large number of parents that wanted their kids to be receiving the health education. <coughs> and this starts in high school or grade school, right? Grade school. Grade school. Yep. Okay, and it goes all through middle school and high school. Yes. And and you're teaching on a skeleton crew, basically. Yes, on there. Okay. At the elementary level, it's taught by elementary teachers, which is very common um, in the state, but it needs to be under direction of a licensed health teacher. Can you explain to me the technology? You, you mentioned technology improvements so you can communicate better. What, what do you need for, for that? I think a lot of what we've been using is you know iPads and being able to get onto the internet using some of the different apps that are available and online textbooks that get updated. Um, I know when I started teaching, the textbooks were already I think they're from 96 so at that point it's almost like as soon as they're published they're already old news so I think allowing us um, allowing our students to be able to access that information one of the state standards is for them to be able to 
look up information for health because as they get older, memorizing the stuff isn't going to help because things keep changing. So I think for us to have more access to um, technology, some type of internet, you know, that we could either get on iPads or tablets or something. Okay. Do you find an age group that is more interested in your, in your pedagogy? Um, I think all of them are, just because there's so many areas that we cover. I think at elementary they really enjoy the friendships and, you know, learning about foods and stuff, and then in middle school getting into um, some of the social dynamics. Mental and, and emotional health. Mental and emotional health. Okay. And then in high school, a lot of them that have ideas of maybe going on to careers in the health field. Thank you. Other questions? Please. I have a question about the curriculum that you're using from 2001. What, so have you found curriculum models that would work for yeah. what you're looking for? Going off of the state standards, they have a lot of stuff out there. We've done a lot of work within our buildings because the curriculum that was written in 2001 is so um, general and broad, you know, allows us to, to update some things. But I think this would help us really scaffold it from K through 12. I think that's where we're lacking the most, especially with elementary not having a lot of minutes. That's what we're hearing from a lot of the elementary teachers is if we can figure out what they need to be taught and then align it so it's the same and everyone coming into sixth grade has the same information. The newer curriculums that are out there will be aligned with Common Core, obviously, so you wouldn't have to <coughs> Yes. about all of that, mm -hmm. trying to figure out how to piecemeal it together. Yes. Other questions or comments? I know of some members of oops, some members of your committee are in the audience. Do you want to um, introduce the rest of them that are? You guys can stand up so I can see. Um, we have Erica Kohlmeyer and Nicole Crosby, guidance counselors. Jarrett Bagneski is um, going to be starting to teach health at the high school and also PE. Karen Coleman, who teaches health at the PE. Angela Frankie, who is an elementary um, teacher, and then also Sarah W, who is an elementary teacher too. All right, thank you. But thank you very much for coming forward and presenting this. So this is the self-study, and you'll be going on from this then to establish and develop curriculum based on the results of the self-study. So for Tom, that's kind of the first step in the curriculum study is to identify what are those opportunities for improvement, um, what are the strengths of what we're doing, and then to take that information and come back then with curriculum recommendations. So thank you very much for all your hard work. Thank you. Thank you. Then the next item is nutrition services. <clears throat> Mr. Gasper, you're going to speak a little bit about the successful, just a little bit about the successful, um, not grant, or the SEEDS program? Yeah, I can uh, talk a little bit about that. Uh, there was an article in the Holman Courier this last week about it, but uh, uh, we did apply for a grant. It was called the Seeds of Change Grant. Um, there was 987 applicants throughout the country for this grant in places like Chicago, Los Angeles, Hawaii, Alaska, everywhere. And um, the first part of the grant uh, was a voting process where people voted for their favorite application. Um, the top 50 vote getters moved on to the judging <coughs> phase of the grant where uh, 17 of the 50 would get a grant um, and we found out uh, a week ago uh, that we actually received a, a ten thousand dollar grant um, those funds will be used in all of our school gardens we have gardens at all the schools um, multiple off-site gardens uh, cornfields uh, and we're starting a, a chicken project or chicken garden as we like to call it uh, we're with uh, working with the FFA um, we'll be raising chickens from egg to market weight and then sending them off uh, to be processed and sent back to us where we will serve them in the cafeteria so uh, <laughs> that is the first such um, project like that in the state so it should be pretty pretty interesting to see how that turns out uh, we were the only school, we were the only organization in Wisconsin uh, to make the top 50 as well. So that was pretty, oh. uh, pretty uh, exciting for us. Yeah. All that voting every day. 
Um, I am here tonight to talk about the uh, food and consumable products bid. Um, <coughs> as you know, every, every couple of years we, we bid this out in an effort to keep prices low. Um, in working with the group of uh, local directors uh, that I meet with on a regular basis, we decided that it would be in our best interest to join forces. Um, Standing alone, we're about a $1 million bid. Um, we joined with uh, Sparta, Toma, Onalaska, Black River Falls, Cochrane Fountain City, West Salem, Bangor, Melrose, Mindoro, Viroqua, and Alma Center. Um, and our $1 million bid became a f over $5.5 million bid. Um, and for these uh, distributors, they're able to offer lower prices when the volume is greater. And that was the whole thought behind our, uh, our madness, so to speak. Uh, so we put out the bid. Um, it's a cost plus bid, which means um, these distributors bid a price um, that's a markup from the cost. So if they pay $5 for a case, their markup is a dollar, then I pay $6 for that case. Um, and that's the way they all do it. Um, one of the local districts in town, or not in town, but in this area that did not join with us, um, they currently pay a dollar five uh, in their cost plus. Uh, we, with this new bid, will be paying sixty cents um, plus the cost of the case. So, uh, as you can see, it really uh, it worked in our favor to to do this. Um, Overall, um, Reinhardt Foods was, a, was the successful bidder. Uh, they were over $38,000 less uh, than the next bidder, which is Baraboo Cisco. Um, so uh, this is an informational uh, presentation, but at your next board meeting, we'll ask that uh, you approve Reinhardt Foods as our prime food and consumable vendor. Any questions? Okay, Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. Where's the chicken farm going to be? Where are the chicken coming from? No, where, where are, are you going to house be? the chicken? Where's the oh. chicken farm going to be? Well, until we uh, figure out all the details, they're going to be at a couple local farms, kids that are in the FFA. Um, we're helping pay for the, for the pens, to build the pens. Uh, those pens will be mobile, so they'll be able to move from farm to farm if we need them to. Um, but uh, it, it should turn out pretty good. Our first batch of chickens um, are here somewhere. In the area, so um, we're hoping uh, uh, Senator Schilling is going to be coming on May 19th to tour our gardens, uh, and we're hoping to be able to show her quite a few chickens as well. So, good, pretty excited about that. That's that's just very cool. I love your foresight, and I love how um, you're always saving us money, but you're never saving quality. You you provide the quality, and all of your staff too. I always make sure I say that. Because we have a great staff. They I've work very to hard. I've talked staff, and um, they're happy to be where they are and what they do. But um, chickens, that's like way cool. I want to come visit the chickens. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully it works well. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> okay, then moving on to health insurance plan. Quote information, Mr. Miller. I see Janice is here this evening. Mr. Clark. Good evening. Um, the, I was just couldn't help but notice the uh, health uh, presentation followed by nutrition leads in great to a health insurance and wellness presentation. So the, that was planned very well. Uh, this uh, tonight we're going to talk about the uh, quotes that were received uh, after a we believe a successful uh, renewal process. This started in February, and you may recall that uh, we wanted to look at a lot of options so that uh, if there were uh, increases, larger increases in the renewal, we would have some uh, uh, kind of a backup plan and also to achieve some goals that had been set forth uh, years ago in trying to uh, move the plan towards wellness and uh, cost uh, containment uh, of the plan. And so uh, this, a lot of uh, hard work with Mr. Clark and Janice Wavra as well as uh, input from the board and, and a lot of employees who over 90 employees participated in the meetings gave us some great input um, the renewal came in and uh, first of all as far as one of the objectives of course is affordability and it came in at 12 percent and that um, was actually a nice surprise because we had based on our claims data you may recall in our presentations that we were looking at perhaps a 30% or more increase. And so with that um, 
better, lower than expected uh, increase, it allows us to achieve a number of objectives that uh, have been on the radar and really advance uh, this uh, program further than we had even hoped. So we're very pleased with it. Some of the ob objectives that, uh, and factors that have been achieved, uh, dual choice has been uh, a request for some time. We'll talk a little bit more about that. Affordability, wellness incentives, very important. We talked a lot about at the meetings of the, uh, the state of our uh, chronic illnesses and things and, and areas that we need to improve there. Access to providers is very important to employees as well as uh, consumer-driven incentives that will help to uh, keep our, uh, our plan sustainable. The um, budgeted increase, you may recall back, as going back even October and December, was at 10%. That was what uh, was plugged in as a budget input variable, you may recall. The renewal is 12%. With um, this plan design strategy that I'll talk about in a minute, um, we were able to keep that, uh, the, the plan that's recommended today to keep within that budgeted increase of 10%. <clears throat> so where was that 10% um, broken out into two pieces? 4% uh, of that 10% is in the area of HR, uh, health uh, reimbursement account uh, outcomes, for, which is, would be outcomes based and about 4% 4, 4 of the 10% would be uh, designated towards that. The other 6% would be towards funding the renewal increase. I'll give you a little more description of that, how that will work. The health uh, reimbursement account, which uh, both, I should say both of those components are uh, geared towards affordability towards employees. What we're looking at is presenting a single health reimbursement account of $500 and family of $1,000. This would be placed into an account for employees that could be used towards um, health-related expenses. But it's an outcomes-based um, approach. And the um, criteria would be achieving 71 points on a wellness score. This was an initiative that was started, I think, over a year ago and some uh, another HRA, which is a health risk assessment, and those who achieved the 71 points would receive this HRA, which is a health reimbursement account, the other type of HRA. Or the other alternative would be a five-point improvement. So even those who, people who did not achieve 71 points could also qualify for this health reimbursement account by improving five points. So it's all geared towards an awareness of healthy lifestyles, wellness, and, and the initiatives that the Wellness Committee are uh, putting forth. So that's, that's one component of it. The other, other side of it, there was this um, increase in uh, rates. And so um, the proposal that's before you is to increase the district's portion of the premium from 80 to 85%. And where did we get that from? There was a, an air, a survey that was done of area schools, and we found that Holman was actually lagging behind by paying 80% whereas area schools are 85 to 87%. So this puts us, uh, keeps pace with area schools is, is what we're going at here. So how does this break down? The, um, how does this impact employees? Their rates um, with this, what we talked about, a dual choice. Uh, one of the things that was presented was having a choice of a, a, a benefit-rich plan or a lower uh, premium plan, and this we feel achieves this very well. Under plan one, and I'll explain in a minute what that includes, there would be a 31% increase. However, after taking into account the health reimbursement account wellness incentive, they could lower that increase to five to 8%, 5% 5 being the single plan, 8% increase being the family plan. Under plan two, which uh, introduces some reasonable uh, benefit modifications, they could see a 25% reduction in their premiums or a 48 to 51% reduction if they uh, qualify for the uh, health reimbursement wellness incentive. The plan design is, is pretty straightforward. Plan one is, same as the, is the same as the current plan with no change. Plan two introduces some higher maximum out-of-pockets, 
but it also addresses those areas that we talked about that we identified in our study that uh, particularly in the chiropractic treatment uh, that would introduce a treatment plan requirement and also in the specialty care uh, which would raise the uh, copay from $25 to $50 for specialty care. And in the packets that you have, I'm not going to go through all the details, you have a complete plan design which goes through line by line uh, each of those areas. We also are adding a, uh, would propose we're adding a free debit card for the employees which could be used for uh, their flexible spending and their HRA spending accounts. Any questions? Questions. Yeah. What's the difference between an HRA and an HSA? I'm going to turn to Janice for that question. Okay. The HRA, there's two Janice, if you could into the microphone. Oh, sorry. Come forward. An HRA plan could either be identified as a health reimbursement arrangement plan, and typically that uh, correlates side by side <coughs> with a group health insurance plan, and they're typically when an employer will go to a higher deductible or out-of-pocket exposure, and the HRA plan is then funded by the employer um, as far as the cost sharing with out-of-pocket. By, by utilizing an HRA plan with a medical plan, then it does help reduce some of the fixed costs with regard to premium. So that's one aspect. An HSA plan is called a health savings arrangement plan. Mm -hmm. And by designing a plan with an HSA, your plan design through your carrier has to be modeled a certain way where you do not have office visit co-pays, prescription co-pays. Everything has to be applied towards a deductible and without having co-pays. So the first dollar benefits for preventative care only. So it's a little bit different model from what, our, what we call our traditional plans. Which one puts the employee more in charge of the, of the funds of making decisions, would you say? Uh, they both can, depending on how the plans are designed. By changing the HRA plan as Ben's proposed, it will engage the employees and their families uh, in more, I think, uh, wellness activities and making better lifestyle choices. An HSA plan, once the dollars are deposited into their account, those dollars can accumulate. Correct. Um, but because the plan design, one of the factors that we have seen as being a negative with an HSA plan is the fact that an employee or the families pay full retail for prescriptions. Right now, they're used to paying a fixed copay, and that's probably the biggest hurdle in going to an HSA model is because you pay full retail for those prescriptions so that typically will drain an HSA account for someone who has multiple prescriptions versus their fixed cost with co-pays. Yeah, I, um, I have an HSA mm -hmm. and I've saved thousands with it. And right. it's, what I like about it is it drives the decisions to the employee. Correct. They realize how much something costs as mm -hmm. opposed to covering it for the employee. And that's a, w a real way, I think, of saving money for the district long term. If we look at, look at the employees as, when, I, when we get the forum here, I made that comment. I, I thought a defined benefits package was better than a defined, uh, where, the, where the employee made their own options, what was best for them. It put mm -hmm. them in charge of their money. That is more of a value I see as far as, because we, we're a service industry, and our employees are huge to us. We've got to have them well paid. We've got to provide them benefits. But in order to control costs, they have to realize, in my opinion, where the money goes and how much it actually costs. So that's just one thing I'm, I'm always looking at when it comes to uh, benefits. Absolutely. The, the way that the proposal is to modify the HRA plan going forward will create that is just similar to with the HSA plan because an employee is going to want to retain those dollars. So I believe that with the model that we're looking at for the HRA plan, they're going to stop and think instead of going in for every little thing, they're going to stop and evaluate, do I really need to or would a phone call to the nurse's hotline or something be more advisory than to continue to, to drive up utilization. So I think we're approaching it this year. This last year by implementing the HRA plan where the employees actually had to start reviewing and examining their explanation of benefits, they really started seeing the cost of care versus having... That's huge. It was a, that was huge. A, it was a step. It was a little hurdle, yeah. and it's, I think it's gone very well. Now, being a, a public employee, they're under a 403 C or something like that? 403 B. Yeah, so they're, they're, they can save different amount of money, and, and, and there's no really... The government doesn't audit them near as much as a 401k, right? Is that true? 
Uh, the auditors are being pretty aggressive lately, I can tell you that. <laughs> okay. Right. Okay. Well, I just was curious because I know there are different savings patterns with the different 401s. Exactly. The, the type of governing bodies that evaluate those plans can differ. Thank you. I have a question on the health risk assessment part of it. And just wondering, so basically it's, it's promoting wellness. Your, your initial assessment appointment is kind of getting a baseline on their overall health but it's also looking at like lifestyle as it relates to their overall health. Uh, if a person has a chronic medical condition that doesn't appear to be related to their own poor choices or lifestyle, and so that increase, or let's say they're not reaching the 71% and to no fault of their own may not be able to get that five point increase or whatever, to get to that point, how, how is that addressed or the How law properly be? requires that uh, when those situations exist, the employee has the opportunity to uh, visit with their physician and have their <clears throat> physician validate that they have a medical condition that would prevent them from achieving those standards. And then also um, the doctor has to verify that the person's following the appropriate appropriate treatment protocol for their condition. Diabetes is one. Right. And so somebody who's diabetic may not be able to reach the 71 or plus 5, but if their doctor says they're diabetic and they're doing everything that mm -hmm. modern protocol says for diabetes, they qualify. If they're diabetic but they're not doing any of the things their doctor says, the doctor says, I'm not going to write you that note until okay. you do what you can to help yourself be as healthy as you can. And so, um, as I said, under the law, and appropriately so, we need to provide an opportunity for those individuals who by no choice of their own uh, couldn't make it in. So um, a question I have, and this may be too simple, but when, as we were preparing the options to put out for bid, we were hearing that we were anticipating a 20, 25% increase on premium. And that's all we were talking about at that point in time. So am I hearing right that the increase was 12%? The yes. total on premium. And so then if we take some of the dollars that we had identified for health insurance, if a person, if one of our staff members chooses the current um, policy, I think the thing said 31%, they'd see a 31% increase in in their premium payment so why would that not be 12 percent i could I, i'm probably the closest to the number so i'll just mention the um when you have a dual choice what you and we explained this in the meetings you'll typically have where the yeah if you could speak to the mic thank you um sorry when you have a dual choice um typically the uh, what the base plan is there's a percentage paid of that and then the employee would pay the difference. And the reason for that is that if the employer pays 85% of the difference, there's not enough difference in cost for the economics to play itself out as far as differentiation. Everybody will gradu uh, gravitate to the more expensive plan. The plan will get into a cost spiral and it will, it will basically uh, self-destruct at that point. So you, th those are the economics that, that have been advised to us and that have, have been found. So what you end up having is a, a separator between the, where they're paying all the difference between that 85% of plan two and plan one. And that's how, the, that's how the numbers worked out. But if we stayed status quo, they, they would just be seeing, all of our employees would see that 12% increase yeah, and there would be no money for wellness right. Correct. Uh, and those types of uh, initiatives we'd be focusing on maintaining the status quo in terms of our health insurance as opposed to moving towards a direction where we create consumer driven and wellness incentives we're using those dollars saved to uh, return them to the employees just to um, make healthier choices so as we were preparing those options, I think the, the idea was that we would then get the information back and status quo was always an option, but then you would be making a recommendation as to 
a new maybe a new initiative or a new direction to possibly be going and the <coughs> dual choice is is the recommendation and I think some of those other options are within that second program we talked about um, chiropractic care and we talked about some other things that I don't know that I've seen the increase I suspect suspect it's increased out-of-pocket plan two has in substantial increase out-of-pocket and those kind of things we're just talking yeah. about whether or not you said substantial increase in out-of-pocket I don't know if I could categorize uh, anything we've done as substantial increase in out-of-pocket um, I was going to ask Ben to go back to the slide which um, showed the factors that we considered um, these have been in place for some time and um, they guide us in the decisions that we make. Um, affordability was a big factor. Um, we had people saying they could no longer afford insurance. And um, if we could continue to offer the current plan, um, affordability would become more and more remote and there'd be fewer and fewer people. This actually creates affordability for some people who may not currently be able to afford. Um, and so those are some of the driving forces. This consumer-driven, as uh, Mr. Cruz has referred to, a plan that really um, helps people think about what's the, what are the best choices. Uh, some skin in the game, if you will, that is, uh, uh, they understand. So um, those are the factors that uh, uh, compelled us to look at the uh, quotes we got and develop this uh, alternative. And just a clarification on that. Uh, the plan one and plan two have the same deductible levels as last year's plan so there's no increase there there is an increase in the maximum out of pocket for plan two by five hundred and a thousand but we are offsetting that with the HRA for five hundred and a thousand so anyone who qualifies for the uh, wellness based HRA would have all of that offset in cost just curious does is this a Cadillac plan that the Obamacare is going to tax higher? Is it? it unless they make some plan modifications. Um, Which is every day, pretty much. Correct. And then that doesn't start until 2018. And we do anticipate that there's going to have to be some modifications to that. Because even some of our higher deductible plans, uh, 2000 in our plant, the office is a $5,000 deductible with an HRA. That's considered a Cadillac plan by the plan design and the cost factors. So. Um, there definitely will have to be some modifications to that regulation at some point. Another question. Yeah, I don't know a lot about health care. I know we're going to keep moving on here. What is the idea of putting, giving the employees a stipend of money and, and putting them into the uh, exchanges and not even carry health care anymore? Is that possible? Jan, Jan, could you use that wireless mic there? That, yeah, thank you. Yeah, that is possible. And in fact, uh, we've uh, visited with Janice on that very topic. Uh, some school districts not too far away, about an hour away north of us, um, are in fact doing that, making it more difficult for employees to get insurance, saying that by making it less available to you, um, you'll be in a better position on the exchange. So Janice, why don't you summarize? I don't agree with the exchanges. I'm not saying I agree with it, but I'm just saying it's reality nowadays. With well, we studied it, so up. we might as well give you a quick, since you asked. Okay. Uh, part of the, the part, okay, with the federal exchange, um, the pricing, I don't know if you've looked at it or not, it's based off the county that you reside in, which plans are available. And in the La Crosse area, Health Tradition, which is the mail uh, system, and Gunderson Health Plan are both the only two in La Crosse County. And your rates are based off of your age and tobacco, non-tobacco rates. And the only way to make them, as far as what we see in the insurance industry, affordable is based off the subsidy. And the subsidy is the amount that's funded by the federal government based off your family-adjusted income. So if, like, the district would eliminate their health insurance plan, that employee doesn't mean automatically they would be eligible for a subsidy because it's based off the family adjusted income and then also if that spouse is eligible for health insurance through their employer that disallows a subsidy as well so you can't just make a broad statement um, one of my employer groups did drop their health insurance plan March 1st because they felt it was better mm -hmm. and they had so much negative feedback yeah. that we implemented a plan again May 1 so because after we did the study and saw the number of, of employees that were going to be impacted with higher 
um, deductibles, higher max amount of pockets than they were accustomed through an employer-sponsored plan, it was much more feasible to restart a plan at this point. I understand. Thank you. You're welcome. Other questions? Question and a, and a yeah. comment. Um, is <coughs> that, as I look at this, uh, the amounts are based upon $5.8 in total annual health insurance premiums. So just doing a little math in my head here, the, the approximate, and I know it's not an exact effect of raising the, uh, the, uh, the contribution from 80 to 85 percent is roughly $290,000 extra additional cost to the district. Is that approximately correct? Yeah, I don't know if I could categorize it as extra cost um, because we're still within the 10 percent we've uh, budgeted, but um, it's, it's, it's rearranging where the district is applying the resources. But the dollar amount is close, very close. And, and just a couple of thoughts with that. Um, first, you know, my thought is we heard some wonderful presentations tonight from a lot of study groups that are in need of money to get to our students. And we have an opportunity here for roughly $290,000 to help with some of those budgets and some of those fundings that would get that money directly to the students to help with education. Um, and that is an opportunity that we have. The, the other concern I have here, and I, I want to be careful with this because it, it's, it's certainly I don't want it to come across as any way a disrespect to anyone. I have just admirable utmost respect for the folks who work in our district. But we've heard from many of them over the last few years of how they maybe feel a little, uh, since Act 10, maybe not as well respected and some of those things within the community. And we've heard that from them. And I, I just want to be very careful that if we go from 80% contribution to 85% contribution, is that going to be negatively perceived by the community and just fuel and inflame that and potentially have a negative consequence where it'll be very good for a group, but it is completely opposite of what's happening out there with most insurance plans in the district and will they just potentially see this as another fueling that fire and we may have some unintended consequences um, that, that we really don't intend to happen um, as, as we've heard about how some people feel and um, the feedback they're getting in the community and that's a concern as well. So. Could I just mention there was a note in here that the um, the, let's see, to change to 85% of Plan 2 premiums, the changes based on the survey of area school districts which reported the typical employer percentage of 85 to 87%. That was the figure that I had seen. So 80% on our end is lower than the average in the area. Yeah, it's an interesting, um, uh, our, our health insurance plan and the premiums we pay have been relatively high based upon the design of the plan, uh, the lack of consumer driven. So even though we were paying 80% versus 85, um, we were paying more in premiums than other districts were because their premiums were lower. Um, the reason we're coupling these two events together is because we're, we're intentionally doing things to drive the premium down. Uh, to a place where it's more competitive with other school districts and feeling that then in kind um, paying that contribution more comparable to the other districts would be appropriate. Uh, that's some of the thinking that went behind the recommendation. Well, wouldn't the, wouldn't the promotion for good health and all those efforts be something that would drive costs down? The in overall the long premium, term. The overall premium group costs down when you pair those two together the eight, the five percent really it's not going to hurt us it's actually going to probably help us in the big picture our belief is that long term the investment in the consumer driven model and the wellness to promote healthy lifestyles which avoid health care costs um, will help to drive our uh, premiums down even further even at 85 percent right yeah, I think, yes. Uh, well, and I think access to those lower costs, um, lower cost health options, like the, health, the smaller health clinics or the special clinics that they offer to do, you know, any kind <coughs> of, of immunization or um, any of the family, smaller family clinics that offer the, the very inexpensive office visits that you're not even charging to your insurance, but you can go there for an earache. You know, those kinds of things I think could really help too. 
Those are some of the uh, more aggressive actions we've taken and employees have embraced. Uh, we've heard nothing but good things about uh, going to those smaller clinics for the more day-to-day -day type um, health care needs that we have. And they're keeping costs down for the employees and for the plan. Have you heard of employers bringing in uh, health clinics into the schools like as an employee, you know, day, some kind of wellness day? We're going to offer... Um, blood pressure screener, we're going to offer immunization clinic, sure. we're going to offer in-house, bringing it to the employees. Have you ever, I don't know if other employers or districts have done things like that. You know, you can go out into the community and find them, but I didn't know if that was something that... Uh, we have heard of those things. That's not on our radar screen right now, but that doesn't mean that... it couldn't be in the future. Other questions? I'll just say I know that Jay's, I've seen his presentations with um, some of these health studies and changing the mindset and I think it there is uh, there's good metrics there I think you're you're in the right direction so I would just note and ask um, the board to take a look at the they do have a second page has the options and the information on the co-pays and that kind of thing so I think that really helps to to look at the details and what the differences are going to be and even the premium amounts and those sorts of things are on there so I think that would be good to call your attention to it as this would be something at the next board meeting um, right we would be looking for approval of this plan so that's correct and I would uh, in closing remind you that uh, we have maintained communication with staff they received the same information the board received on mm -hmm. Friday um, we received I'd say a hand, unless it changed late this afternoon a handful mm -hmm. of questions uh, from staff and are responding to those you do not see in the materials you have a three-year direction mm -hmm. and uh, that is our intent to uh, continue to operate on that model um, we'd like to find out where this settles in if this uh, we don't want to be too presumptuous if this recommendation is approved we'll be looking again at developing a three-year direction to help staff understand where we plan on going or are thinking of going in the future and I do appreciate that communication with staff as well I know it's one thing to get these things on paper and to take a look at it but to really digest it then and um, to fully understand what you're recommending I think is helpful so hopefully folks will um, mm -hmm. tune in or so, so as we bring this forward to you in two weeks, this is really be important for you to, if you have questions, get those to us. We'll then share it with all of you and um, so that we can help do anything we can to help prepare you for that uh, decision in two weeks. Anything else? No, we were just saying uh, uh, in agreement with uh, Dr. Carlson's note that we really have a very short turnaround time and if we want to properly communicate with staff, uh, we can't get to the next meeting and say, well, let's table this for okay. another. Um, so uh, it, yes, very much agree. Okay. All right, great. Thank you very much. Then moving on to computer purchase, Dr. Carlson. You have a draft of an issue paper in your board packet. We would be coming to you at the next board meeting for your consideration and approval. This is not asking for your approval <coughs> to purchase computers. That's something that ongoing we do within the budget. But what we're asking you to do to consider, uh, we, we, you've done this occasionally over time, to allow an advanced purchase of funds. In other words, we would be really borrowing from next year's IT budget and we think that this would allow us some flexibility uh, to within the budgeting uh, process we've uh, Jan has already ordered so again this is not to approve a purchase this is to create some uh, flexibility for us uh, budget wise and uh, we believe we believe uh, we can do this within this year's and then we'll closer examine next year I'll just say the uh, reason why we've moved forward right now and not wait for after July 1 we have some things that we feel we can do yet this school year and summer school in June and, and then also ultimately to get things in place uh, this large order of uh, desktops and so on for our teachers for, for the start of the school year so, yeah, so go ahead. this is not a purchase you said 
We've already made the order, so we're not coming to you to ask for approval of a purchase. We're going to make this work regardless, but we are asking the board to allow us to have that flexibility of um, that advance purchase funding from next year's budget. So in other words, what you, what you would expect is, um, as of July 1, the 2014-15 budget, that allocation to IT would be reduced by this amount, um, by the amounts that I have, like the 201,000, okay? <coughs> Does that answer your question? Mm -hmm. Okay. So our 540 desktops, is is that enough? No. Uh, no, we're, plan to buy more? we're this is just an ongoing plan and again this is not again you don't see one to, you don't see laptop or um, mobile devices but this is a priority that's been looked at for our staff and our and some of our computer labs so yeah Anita this does not achieve yet <coughs> the entire need even with our desktops but it's a big step forward we continue to work on that as well. So this is 540. Do you know how many we would need in order to accomplish replacing all the outdated? I know Jan's not here. I know she she had. Um, I have that. I don't have it with me. Oh. I, I'm sorry about. And is, yeah. is also could we can we get a report like follow up on the digital transition that the district has been going through? Just where we're at, and uh, yes. Okay. Yes, sir. Can find and another two hundred ninety thousand. And sorry. And then, <laughs> I know I had mentioned something maybe a month or so ago, but I, I guess I have to mention it again. Um, maybe it would be time to think about a referendum for technology in the district. Um, and talking about one-to-one um, -one technology or bring your own technology because we're really we're getting pretty far behind every every other district in the area we don't need a referendum to talk about the one-to-one -one technology or the the bring your own do we I mean no not to talk about it but bring it up one, again yeah, some some kind of referendum to come up with the one. for the one-to-one -one. <clears throat> Prior to the referendum, could we talk about the bring your own technology, though? Mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. it's something that I know that was brought up a while ago, and then it just all of a sudden This is something, again, in the last report I had mentioned to you as we continue <coughs> to move door, farther down the road on this. Um, I have suggested to the board that um, to meet some of our timelines that we want to achieve um, some alternative funding revenue sources, and I think referendum was mentioned. Um, it'd be something that, again, if we want to achieve the timelines that I believe we should, that we need to, we're going to need, we, I don't believe we have the capacity right now to continue to repurpose um, unless we want to get into areas such as staffing and things like that. Uh, so we'll continue to repurpose. It doesn't mean a referendum takes care of all of it. We'll continue to repurpose, but, but anyway, um, I would agree. So what's our next step to get that going? I'm an impatient person. I am. <laughs> Good uh, question. <laughs> well, um, we could, if uh, the board directs us, we can administratively begin to work on a plan. We already have. We have laid out a, a technology plan. Now, you've heard parts of that, big pieces of that direction. And uh, we continue to put some dollar figures to that that you have not seen yet. And that hopefully would help frame really what we'd be looking at for that funding need. I would, I would possibly suggest even a separate special meeting to focus specifically on that. That might be beneficial for the board. Okay. So we could look so. forward mm -hmm. to that. In order to be, have a referendum, say at the next, in August, I think is when the next primary, to do it along with a already scheduled 
mm -hmm. um, election, we would have to go, is it six weeks out? We'd have to be about six weeks out, so we would be looking at some time in June, July, in order to have that. Yeah, there would be some of those requirements, but uh, beyond that, you want to make sure you're allowing yourself um, more than enough time to educate mm -hmm. and that type of thing. So there's 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 those requirements you need to meet, but beyond that, so I uh, we can we can provide that for you as well. Look at some dates and it per perhaps some advantages, disadvantages um, for those. And then how that whole, uh, I know Mr. Clark has helped me understand of how, again, that cycle um, to really put that in place and the impact it would have, again, uh, mill rate and so on. Um, and that cycle, and whether in November, whether it's August, whether it's February 2015, so look at look at those uh, possibilities. Okay. okay. Materials at your place this mm -hmm. evening um, regarding the the graduation events. May 27th, which is a Tuesday, is our board meeting, uh, second board meeting in May. Then there's a retirement reception at 3:30 at the district office here, where we recognize all of those individuals who are retiring um, this year. And then June 4th is the CESA convention. Any board meeting reflection, comments? Seeing none, I would entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Is there a second? Second. Discussion? Okay, all in favor of adjourning, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Aye. Motion carries. <laughs> we are adjourned. Oh. Trouble, trouble. Gary. Thank you. They have they make they're able to make decisions on extra time for employees to work and, and you see that and so that's what has been happening. And so that that has been part of that discussion. Um, about it's been funded, Anita, out of that for the past uh, several years. And so that would be looking at the trend and what we've been doing already, perhaps utilizing some of that uh, for this. Not all. So the, is this the only personnel that's funded out of the IT budget now? Because I think I, what Anita's talking about was where we separated the, those personnel Correct. costs right. out of the right. IT budget and... This is just the only portion of this cost um, is just the extra time. So this is would be the only personnel then budgeted from the IT budget. That's I believe so. I let me let me follow up if you, and I will report back. Okay. I don't know if Jay was going to find the answer or no. Okay. Well, and I I was just looking at <coughs> so whether or not we would have that answer right now, but. And so is this, in, you mentioned staffing, so is this included in the staffing that we're up to? I have this separate. Okay. Just, just because it was not ready for the last board meeting. So I have not put this in okay. and, and made it uh, because I am having that presented to you tonight for approval. This I would not be asking you to approve tonight. So if this is a permanent position though, it's not really an extra position. So why would it be funded from the IT budget? Well, again, that's just part of this proposal, if that's something that, do we have an answer? Maybe we could help, I, so I, I, I think we do. The, the concern is that we really have not set aside money in the IT budget for staffing. We, we pulled that out of the IT budget and funded out of the district personnel budget. Um, some years ago, um, outside of that dialogue, um, we decided to allow uh, budget authorities um, to have the extra and overtime money. We had a district budget. It was in the personnel budget. And um, we said, you know what, um, rather than us keep track of this, why don't we just allocate it all out to you? What we found out was that pretty quickly they stopped having overtime and extra time and started using it in other ways to fund program activities. Um, so it worked out pretty well. The IT budget was personnel, and of the referendum dollars that we had, 
um, a, had been approved for uh, for technology years ago, and I think there was then the decision made to pull that out of the IT budget so that we knew for software and um, hardware and those kind of purchases exactly what we had because it, the amount was diminishing every year as the um, personnel compensation part was going up it was diminishing what we could do um, so it sounds like this wasn't this was something that Jan had decided was something that she needed those additional hours for this position so budgeted within the IT budget this was a Jan kind of decision and so now I are you talking about taking this out and just keeping it out then is that what this is this is doing would just be removing that right making those hours permanent the to extra. this person so it's part of the position always and not just extra time but the, but, but because when it was extra time it was paid for under her budget right now it that it's going to be permanent any. it would go under the personnel budget but it would reduce the IT budget by that 6100 not the full amount no I think what we're going to do is look at the last <coughs> few years and what an average was on that and go from there is it is that how it's done in each department like in each building does every budget authority have this same rule kind of applied to them their extra time yeah they have an extra time overtime budget and then they determine what that is used for this seems like the IT budget is shrinking 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 all the time so I, I it's a it's a yeah it's a fair question but again these dollars this, thank you for going back a, a few years all the way back to when we as a we made that change in allocation uh, taking it from more of the district on the overtime and giving it out to the budget authorities so I think that's very helpful to really think of that history and uh, that's what that is coming from within so a few years ago there was extra money added in for this yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. she's just given a portion of it back because she says this position is really the critical piece here that's doesn't diminish the fact that if Jan was here I know and we all would say it's an <coughs> area we continue to look at for more dollars in our technology I know you're very well aware of that you're supportive of any effort we can make and um, perhaps uh, even up to talking about a referendum in the future so um, this is just another piece okay. Okay. thank you and now we move on to the reason we are here <laughs> the next item is our high school graduation candidates 271 students holy mackerel that's a lot of handshakes yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I can't wait <laughs> so so again you this also appears on your consent agenda and we just bring this to you we mm -hmm. Uh, and Mr. Bear is in the audience too, and so we all look forward to May 24th. But we do ask the board every year to officially approve the list of graduates, mm -hmm. and so that will be on the consent agenda. This is a uh, time where if you have any questions, and again, these are uh, the students as we know it today and what we anticipate come May 24th. Okay. Any questions? One of the larger classes, isn't it, Mr. Bayer? I think, yeah, I think so. And then just the note: uh, graduation date for 2015 is May 22nd. Dr. Carlson, any comments or? No, just continuing on the same pattern that we had <coughs> for many years on Memorial Day weekend. Okay. Then we will move on to the consent agenda. I think there are six items this evening for us I would unless anyone would like to consider an item separately um, I would like to consider item 10.4 separately um, the staffing 10.4 we can pull that out any other items you'd like to consider separately so then I would entertain a motion to approve the consent agenda items as presented with the exception of item 10.4 Is there a second? A second. 
discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor of approving the consent agenda items as presented, with the exception of item 10.4, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Motion carries. Then item 10.4, staffing report. I would entertain a motion to approve the staffing report as presented. Is there no motion? So if there's no motion, then the, the uh, staffing report would not be approved. And Dr. Carlson, I think, had indicated um, approval would um, allow him to move forward with the high school issues. By not approving it, we, he would not be able to move forward with those items. Well, I think that we should make a motion to approve the staffing report. Um, Is there a second before we have discussion? No second. If we don't, if we don't okay, get a second, if we don't have, then we can't discuss it either. That's what I want. I want to get to the discussion part so we can talk. Okay, I'll second. Okay, so now we can have discussion. So Gary, you were starting to. Um, yes. Um, <coughs> we've gotten a lot of a lot of feedback from the public, from the teachers, and it seems obvious to me that this the second grade class at Lake is it Laking? Evergreen. Evergreen. Yeah, I'm Evergreen. Sorry, Evergreen. Uh, is there's something exceptional going on here that we have to deal with. I'm a little surprised that the administration didn't come forward and say this group, we, we took a look at this group and we evaluated them and we think they need some extra help there, either in the form of uh, additional teachers and support or keeping this section in three sections. And we haven't heard anything from the administration and that, that kind of disappoints me a little. But what I'd like to do is, the staff report is fine, but this group here, I don't think a student is a student is a student. And like we talked about last, last year, or last time, board meeting, maybe we have to have a weighted average where uh, uh, a wheel bound, wheelchair bound student is, we count as two students. Uh, a, a child that has been uh, diagnosed with a, di a difficult problem or a difficult <coughs> hand, a student in this classroom should be counted as two students or a student and a half. So that we staff the classrooms with the right amount of, amount of teachers we got the right amount of students there. If we could have 30 kids in the third, third grade class, I have no problem with that if all the students were like my grandchildren. <laughs> <laughs> but if, you know, if all the students are, are good achievers, they're good learners, um, they're well disciplined, um, perhaps you could do that. But a student isn't a student is a student. And I think, I don't know how to deal with this. I, I'd like to deal with this class and make an exception and say, <coughs> let's, let's leave this class at three sections and then let's take a look at how we how we staff these classes instead of saying 30 students maybe we should take another look at that and say 30 students with you know the wheelchair bound student being counting as two and um, uh, physically disabled students counting as one and a half or something so because to have a cold cut black and white 30 students you know, there's, there's going to be exceptions both ways. I and mean, you have a class full of perfect students, you maybe could have 35 in there. But if you have a, a class that's difficult to deal with, and then we've heard it over and over and over with this group is from the teachers and from the parents that, that for whatever reasons, that's, this class is difficult to deal with. And I think we owe it, owe it to them to give them some assistance. I, can I make a comment? Please, uh, yes. Uh, I agree with you, Gary. I think the thing that seems to be the message that we're sending if we don't respond as a district or look at this is that we are more worried about setting precedents over everybody gets it. We're going to look at everything the same. So then now every school, every grade is going to want to have the same opportunity. That's the worry more than maybe what some of those individualized needs are. And I would hate to have that be the message we're sending. Tim? I was just going to say, I, I think for me, one of the things that has made this particularly, uh, probably one of the more difficult, I think, decisions that I've had in a long time 
You know, I find it very interesting. We get these boarded administrator reports every meeting. They're in our packet. And I'm, I'm just reading the one that came tonight. Oh, Responsibilities of the board. Hiring staff, no role except for hiring the superintendent. Staff assignment, no role. Firing staff, no role. Uh, personnel policies approves. And that's always kind of been my philosophy as a board member. But this situation is so unique and so challenging that it, it, it really has caused me to question the, the policy itself that we've set. And I really agree with Gary that I think we do need to look at that policy. Um, you know, and, and if you listen to some of my comments earlier tonight, I am all about the student education and what's going to foster that more than anything um, in the district. Um, that to me is, is number one is that student. And um, that's why this is so difficult because my normal mindset of following these, I've always been on the role of the board is to set policy. But I think here, um, you know, maybe not setting precedent, but I think that there is an exception. And I think our policy needs to be looked at. And for that reason, um, I, I really think that this class does need to be looked at, and I, I think our policy needs to be looked at. Other discussion? I, I, I guess, Anita? I'm sorry, were you going nope. to care? Okay. Um, when I looked at the, um, the numbers that Dale provided us with for <clears throat> next year, I saw that even at, at Viking, there's a um, second grade class that if there's one more student added, there would need to be a section added. So the numbers are, are dire even in other schools across the district. But I don't know what the student population is at Viking. I haven't heard that there are kids with really extreme special needs in that student group at Viking. I have heard from these teachers and these parents at Evergreen. Um, and I guess it, I kind of put myself in their position. If I, if I was a parent of, a, of one of those kids, I wouldn't want, I, picture yourself as that student trying to learn in that environment. It would be pretty darn hard. Picture yourself as a teacher being graded on how well these kids learn. You wouldn't get a very good grade as a teacher in that environment trying to teach those kids. So we're kind of setting both groups up for failure. And <coughs> yes, I, I'm pretty, I'm a by the rules kind of person. I don't. I'm, I'm kind of black and white, but um, things like this where there really are extenuating circumstances and you have, you have groups that are different. We are not all the same. And this is a can of worms, and I, I heard uh, that term tonight. Um, the lady who spoke and said, I know you guys don't want to open this can of worms, and that's true, but, you know, sometimes I've been on the board for, you know, a million years, and <laughs> there have been a couple cans of worms that need to be opened and looked at. And, I don't want those kids to have to be squished into a classroom with a shoehorn, and I don't want those teachers to be set up for failure. So um, if we have to come up with some, some way to let them succeed and find another section, we do. And, and then we make this exception, and then we look at this policy in the CELC committee, and we examine it. But this is kind of an emergency situation, like other emergency situations that have come up. We have a we, we take care of it right away, and then we have time to look at it, and we set a new rule, and then we can apply it in the future. But this is pretty dire. Yeah. This is pretty. This seems pretty extreme to me. Once we agree. Kate. Um, I just think we can't pick and choose when we diversify. We are encouraging our teachers um, to diversify, to match. The needs of children based on who those children are and when we look at class sizes I think we need to diversify yeah Tim you're right um, the makeup of a classroom greatly impacts the teaching that goes on in there and uh, teachers in our district no I'm not saying anything negative about what you do you always always do the best I think Dale said that last week you always do the best with everything we've given you but I think that this is an exception, and diversification in my vote needs to be honored in this case. Um, I look at um, our formula, and if the citizens look at our formula, most citizens will see that what we kind of are recommending is that third grade is like 24. That's what the chart says. But then you get into this formula. And you realize, well, the formula is not maxed until maybe a classroom gets to 30. 
Okay, then we go back to, okay, and what are the special needs with that? So it's not like we're tricking them. This is what districts do. But the reality of the situation is I, I wonder really how many times we get very close to 29 or 30. And, and let's even consider the fact that third grade, when you look at it with Common Core, with all the changes that are going on with state testing, third grade is kind of the new fourth grade. It used to be fourth grade, where our teachers knew that the children aren't just learning to read, they're reading to learn that's all been bumped down and our our teachers know this there are higher expectations on those third graders so when you go from a smaller number to a larger number but you also increase the expectations for those third graders um it's a problem to me that i that i just can't support if i picture it was a grandchild or a daughter or my neighbor's kid or whoever and it's interesting because i think a lot of people would step up to the board and say oh, i wouldn't want my child in a classroom with her <laughs> and yet we're expected maybe to support that i can't um because of that i i think that exceptions can be made that a can of worms can be open, but the lid can always be put on top. I think we're smart enough to hear what those special conditions are. And um, so that's why I pulled okay. that out. And Tom, did you have anything? Yeah, I, um, all I've heard is the, the parents, the, the passionate parents about how this bad the situation is. And I honestly don't know how bad it is because I never heard any uh, from the professional in the classroom, the teacher, the administrator, the, the uh, administrator, but the principal. I still very new in this whole game. So I'm, I claim a little bit of ignorance with it. But we have a policy that I remember looking at it last board meeting, it's only two years old. So um, it's not like it's 20 years dated. So, and I think class sizes change. And I think it's um, bad policy to change a policy in the middle of the stream. So I wouldn't, I would stick with the policy for right now. And, and maybe if it's, uh, but be flexible enough or maybe you can, uh, you can change it in some other ways when the school starts. I don't know, but I just think it's from a leadership perspective, from a vision perspective, we have a policy. It was approved two years ago. We should stick with it. Thank you. Well, and I have a couple of thoughts. I know that um, I'm also, I think as Anita said, a kind of a policy wonk, and I really do like to see us follow our policies. But one thing that we discovered at the last meeting was that we identify five or six things that should be considered when setting a classroom size, mm -hmm. but we really weren't. We were really just doing the numerical. And that is, has been the status quo forever. Before Dr. Carlson came here, that was how we had done it. Um, so I worry about those other classrooms. I see classrooms at Sand Lake that while parents haven't come and expressed their concerns, very much the same thing may be happening at Sand Lake where we've got a classroom of 29 students next year, 27.6, well, okay, so 28 fourth graders or 27 third graders at Viking and Prairie View will have 22 kindergartners. Um, I would, those red classes, I would like to see us do even more. I think as we're suggesting we do here, take into consideration if those issues um, are also should be addressed and then have the administration come back to us and report to us on um, all of those areas where we may see some red, um, I guess highlights because they are so close to being over what we as a board has set. And I know I did ask Kate and Kate said she did initial, um, introduced it to the Student Learning Achievement and Learning Committee tonight and they are gonna be taking this up and I think some of the suggestions that you uh, made this evening will be good for the administration to look at as far as it's kind of what WIAA did with the private schools to give them a higher number, a, a multiplier or something when we have that, but um, situations like that. So it's been a great learning experience for us and I think I would like to see us open up that can of worm and if we're gonna open it up for one, we should open it up for all of those things that exist right now in our district and not just one 
because we have wonderful staff and parents who have come forward really help us understand what's going on so Cheryl are you saying you want to increase, <coughs> increase the matrix maybe look at the policy down the road and see if there's other variables we need to consider I think and what I'm hearing and I'll just kind of summarize and the the board can tell me if I'm wrong is that there they would like to see some consideration given to those other um, can't re uh, uh, issues that vantage points such Very as the built the size of the classroom you know physically can what's it going to be like with 30 students the makeup of the class what you know what number of special needs what number of students who may not have an IEP but also have already been identified as needing assistance those kind of things but for right now I think the board is nodding and saying we need to at least look at this we can't you know the approval of the staffing report this tonight won't eliminate our being able to do this it we're just giving an instruction to the administration to come back to us at the next meeting with a recommendation for the other sections as well I would hope you would support that um, and then um, but if we approve the staffing report this evening it would allow Dr. Carlson and Mr. Bayer to start advertising for those positions that are in the high school portion of the staffing report this is critical for our school year isn't it for them <coughs> Dr. Carlson I'll let you speak to that with the high school sections they are in the middle of scheduling and yes uh, to answer your question it would be timely to be able to move forward so that we can get students scheduled ideally uh, if not before the end of the school year close to it I heard I also heard from the board that we'd like this this class that we've been talking about we'd like to have have that we'd like to have that, that ready taken care of and have that class either stay in three sections or offer additional help with that class I don't I don't want to smooth that over I think <coughs> we have to deal with that class specifically and get that done and then we can take a look at the other ones even though um, we haven't heard a lot from the other school rooms and stuff but I think we have to deal with this one uh, I, don't, I don't want to sweep it under the rug or not ignore it. I think we need to deal with this specific plan. One way or the other. We can approve this and move on, but I just don't want, I don't want it to cause us not to deal with this class. And I would think after the discussion this evening, Dr. Carlson, I think it's pretty clear that the majority of the board would like to see this class um, addressed and with the possibility of the other at least come back to us get that input from the teaching staff that we've received some really good inf information um, as far as the makeup of those other classes and please make sure we don't have another one out there yeah. exactly I'm, I just asked for clarification then yes I'm so I'm sorry, Mr. Medica. No, I was just going to say I'm not sure the best way to accomplish this because I agree. I, I don't want to support this with the language that's in there for the elementary school at this time. And we'd be very uncomfortable voting for this given that language. Um, and, and at the same time, you know, at least conceptually, you know, as I said, this was difficult, but I do support the, the adding of an additional section uh, for that. So I don't know if we amend that to add an FTE to the elementary or if at this time we make an amendment to approve without the elementary pending him bringing back more information. Um, Does that work? But I don't know what would be the best solution at that this point. But I'm uncomfortable supporting as is with the, uh, the way the wording is in the elementary. I think either way uh, is an option for you that um, you could just set aside the elementary piece and again as Mrs. Hancock mentioned at any time at a future board meeting you can increase so but but to Mr. Dunlap's point too I, I understand not wanting to lose this and wanting to address it so um, you can also you you could direct uh, change amend this to add an elementary section specifically you could target for the evergreen third grade um, I have follow-up clarification questions that I will need on such things as standards um, to be developed for how we define a class makeup 
and because we already do uh, in so many areas of our special areas of special needs have a process of identifying um, that staff support but specific to the regular classroom well, we would need that, some work this, to do that. The opinion of the, of the administration and the staff that this, this class does not need additional help. Is that what you're saying? Um, we have not done the Ms. Krakow, we have not completed that staffing plan piece yet. But that would be different than number of sections. So but the, what is the, the staffing? The fact, what is the possibility the class size would drop by the time school started? What is, the, what is the percentage of that happening? Oh boy, a percentage of it happening, I cannot answer that. Does it happen? Yes, it does. But again, that's hard to project. Every class, every year is different. And so some of the trend data is really hard to use on that. I did provide you some information um, that you had asked for, at least some history of how things kind of evolve from that preliminary staffing all the way through the start of the next school year. I and think I, that was only one a one year snapshot and we we can certainly do that beyond that but hopefully that even that was for um, <clears throat> this current year going back a year ago and hopefully that provides a little bit of how numbers can fluctuate from that pre-planning um, up until the time we start school. I think in the staffing report you indicated that there would be no change in the number of sections um, in the elementary level, but the reality was that Evergreen was going to lose a section, correct? And that I you know, it's going from second to third. Maybe. No, but they would lose a section, a teacher section. Yeah, I was talking more district wide. Right. So district wide, right. what right. the staffing report says is 76, I think, and that's what we currently are at. And in the past, that has been my recommendation to come to you on total numbers of elementary sections, for example. And yet we know as the summer develops, there's some tweaking that needs to be done. Sometimes that has shifted between schools. Sometimes you know, those of you that have been on the board, we've come to you to recommend the addition of uh, increase in those sections even after that staffing plan had been presented and acted on. Uh, but again, that has all those decisions over the summer have all been driven by those guidelines that we have followed for some time that's within that administrative rule. But you're not saying within elementary that there's no, I mean, staffing as a result, additional staffing will need to be approved prior to moving forward with posting. Correct. I have not come to you to ask for any increase in elementary staffing at this time. And it, and it says historically the board hasn't wanted to have an increase in right. positions, staffing positions. Well, historically just means once at this, this that's, past that's, year. I'm just reading it from okay. this. That's, that's right. Is there any opportunities with, um, with specialized education to get it to Medicare or something? to save on our insurance costs? That's kind of a wide open question, I suppose, but. No. No? Uh, no. <laughs> okay. What language do you want to have struck? Because we could have a motion. There isn't. Would you like to amend the report? We're looking at it. Okay, all right. I guess I would like to make a motion then to um, exclude the uh, elementary section from the staffing report at this time. Is there a second? I would second that. So any more discussion on the elementary staffing since that's part of the amendment? I just want to make make it known <laughs> again, make sure everybody understands that we want this class to be treated differently than mm -hmm. yes. in a time frame to be addressed to be well, by the next be. meeting. A plan. That the dis to have them come back with a recommendation at the next meeting because we certainly have been hearing about this for a while so yes. I'd like to thank the parents and teachers who came forward and mm -hmm. let you know that you really made a difference so 
So then there is a motion and a second to amend the staffing report by eliminating the elementary section from the report. Um, voting just on the amendment, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Motion carries. Then there is a motion and a second on the floor to approve the staffing report as amended. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Motion carries. So then we move on to board member reports and discussion. I'll call on board members in the order of roll call for any comments or committee reports that you may have. Um, except I don't have the list on there, so I need to go back here. And I'm gonna, my computer is gonna die on me, on my iPad. So, I will start with Mr. Menninger. Uh, just as Three really quick comments. <coughs> Again, thank you for everybody to coming out to the meeting tonight. I always like it when we have participation people, and it's always great when we, uh, no offense to any of the other reports, but always wonderful when we actually see the students here. That's always one of my highlights of the meeting, so thank you uh, there as well. Um, also, you know, if, as we sit here in, in the cool weather that's coming, uh, we can certainly look at the bright side, and I think that's going to help with student learning and keep people a little focused and not get the, uh, the summer-itis uh, kicking in early, um, so always good. And uh, some great, great sports teams out there this spring, so uh, certainly get out and cheer on. As it won't be long, we'll uh, have that little summer break. So, uh, and then cool. football, I know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> start down the so. football countdown. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Lisa Collins. I want to repeat what... Gary said about I think it really helps us as board members to know what's going on in the <coughs> district and how policies and um, different initiatives are are that are carried out how they're affecting actually how things operate and I so I really appreciate that with with staff and um, community members parents students coming and putting their neck out there and talking about difficult issues um, staff appreciation breakfast Thing tomorrow morning I'm going I'm going <laughs> it's date yeah so that should be fun I've not been to one of those yet that should be neat that's it thank you Gary Dunlap nope, some of us have to work tomorrow okay. I have to work I'm taking vacation <laughs> um, I just, I just <coughs> have to say it's great to have everybody come and give presentations to the school board and, and it seems like the last few months we've really been on a roll and it seems like we're really gaining some momentum here and everybody should be really proud of the school district so I have. Thank you, Tom Cruz. Um, no, just this, the students. Very interesting. It's always nice the enthusiasm. I'm, I'm really enjoying my experience. So keep up the good work. You're getting A's so far. <laughs> thank you, Anita Jagosinski. Um, I just wanted to thank the staff members and the parents who came and spoke on behalf of Evergreen. Um, thank you. I know it's been a long day for you. Been a long day for me too because I was at the Evergreen principal interviews bright and early today. So, um, but thank you for your input, um, and that's all I have. Kate hey, Mayor, um, ditto to everything that everybody else said. When I look in the eyes of our people, community members, and teachers, um, you fill me with such great pride. And uh, you're right, Lisa. You know, sometimes that's like putting your neck out there. You just never know. So I hope that you know this is.